Start moving and keep moving. Need a reason to get physically fit? Physical deconditioning is the leading cause of preventable death in the world. No matter how much or how little you're in shape, you've got to start somewhere. So take the first step to getting fit. Get up and move even a little. You start experiencing benefits immediately. You're listening to Healthy Looks Great on You Lifestyle Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. This is episode 102, Get Fit. Start where you are and keep moving. You'll learn the benefits of physical activity and why it matters, as well as some tips to get started. Do you think of yourself as physically fit? For some people, this is their identity. You know, their email address is sallybigmuscles at email.com. For others, it's a pipe dream reserved for the fit sallies of the world. Want some good news? Any amount of exercise moves you in the right direction. Seriously, the minute you start getting active, the minute the benefits start. At any level and any amount. Wow, you cannot say that about very many things in life. And the benefits, well, they're plentiful. Physical activity makes you look better, feel better, and enjoy a greater quality of life. Stronger muscles, good balance, and flexibility keep you doing all the great things you do. Physical fitness has an enormous impact on your health. It also affects your quality of life. So don't be a spectator. Get off the bench and get in the game now. Here's the bad news. Most Americans don't get the minimum recommended daily amount of exercise, which is 150 minutes of moderate to intense exercise every week. Only about 25 to 33% of people even reach that goal. This means that more than 66% of people are not active enough. Let's move that needle up and start moving today. For those of you who are meeting that goal, you need to watch your sitting time. Even those who are in great condition have increased risk of disease with prolonged sitting. We're gonna talk about that, but before we go to the lab, we gotta start in the classroom and learn some definitions and terms that are important to understanding physical fitness. There are four types of exercise, aerobic, strengthening, which is also known as resistance training, flexibility, and balance. First, let's talk about aerobic exercise. This is the one that uses your body's large muscle groups in a rhythmic and repetitious pattern. And no, it doesn't mean you have to wear yoga pants, go to the gym, or act like Richard Simmons. <laughs> Remember him? He was a fitness guru in the 80s and had that big curly hair and a big personality that had a lot of energy to go with it. But really, aerobic exercise can look like a lot of different things. What it does is ramp up the amount of oxygen that your body is consuming and it increases your heart rate. This one really gets your blood pumping and that's important because your entire body depends on circulation to function. And as you age, your arteries tend to get stiffer and that makes them more narrow and then that puts strain on the heart. What exercise does is it counteracts that by making the blood vessels open up and dilate. There are also benefits at the cellular level. You may have heard of having a heart scan to look for calcium buildup in the coronary vessels. Well, what exercise does is it boosts the calcium transport systems in your sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now remember, this is mini medical school, so I had to throw a big word in for you. Physical activity reduces mitochondrial dysfunction and reduces markers of systemic inflammation like C-reactive peptide. Don't sweat the science. What you really need to know is that exercise affects the immune system, bone strength, the gut, nervous system, heart, liver, endocrine system, blood vessels, adipose tissue, which is fat, and of course your muscles. See, Sally was on to something. She'll probably live a long time. My grandfather lived to be 91 years old. And this is the cool part. He walked on a treadmill that was downstairs in his basement for about 45 minutes every day until about two weeks before he passed away. I remember him always saying he was afraid if he stopped moving, he wouldn't be able to get started again. Wise words from a man who lived a good nine decades and was able to push mow his yard. So listen to Papa and keep moving. If you do, you may or may not live to be in your 90s, but here are some convincing statistics. 
Briskly walking 75 minutes a week adds 1.8 years to life. Bump it up to 90 to 150 minutes and add two and a half years. Really go for it and walk briskly for 200 minutes a week and you get an extra three years. Wow, who knew just walking could be so beneficial? Now, I wanna tell you there's a difference between brisk walking and strolling. Of course, strolling is better than not moving at all and if you're really deconditioned, it is a great place to start. But brisk walking implies more exertion. The intensity of aerobic exercise can be measured by what's called the talk test. Now, most people who know me at all say if there was a test on talking, I would set the curve, but this is different. Exercise intensity is divided into low, moderate, and vigorous or intense. So if you can carry on a conversation with ease and you could sing a song or recite the Pledge of Allegiance, then you're exercising at low intensity. Now, remember low intensity exercise is better than nothing. So I don't want to discourage you. But if you can talk in short sentences and not sing, well, that's considered moderate. Intense exercise means you're just huffing and puffing and you can't speak more than a few words. Think about that the next time you're circling the block and try to ramp it up a little more. Remember, the benefits start immediately. So even if you aren't able to walk briskly for any significant length of time, you can just get started where you are. And if you need help making changes in your lifestyle, you'll wanna be on my newsletter list. You'll get access to a free course with a downloadable workbook called Seven Day Prescription for Change. It'll help you get started moving in the right direction. Aerobic exercise does so much for you. It lowers your risk of heart disease, cancer, and just the overall chance of dying. It also improves glucose metabolism, your lipids, your overall quality of life, and sleep. Physical inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor for dying of anything, and poor physical fitness is the number one cause of preventable death in the world. In fact, if just 25% of people moved more, it would prevent 1.3 million deaths globally. And that applies to people who are normal weight and also those who are overweight. Now, let's talk about the second type of exercise. That's strength training or resistance. This includes using stretchy bands or weights. It doesn't have to mean barbells or push-ups, but if you're able, go for it. Strength training has a ton of benefits too. It makes your muscles get bigger and stronger, hello, Captain Obvious, but it also reduces fatigue, the chance of injuries, reduces your body fat, and the risk of falling. And for people who have joint pain from either arthritis or some kind of chronic back pain, strengthening your core and other muscles can help more than anything else. Resistance training can improve sleep, cholesterol levels, cardiovascular health, mental health, liver function, and blood sugar control. Plus, it makes you look buff and reduces your body fat. If you ever thought maybe you wanted to reset your metabolism, pick up some weights and repeat. Pick up some weights and repeat again. The next type of exercise is balance training. This one is crucial to prevent falls. Here's the deal. If you don't have good balance when you're young, well, it's probably not going to get any better as you age unless you do something different. And the chance of dying after a hip fracture is 20% and another 20% of people go in a nursing home. So if you have osteoporosis, your chances of a fracture are increased. So what do you need to do? Well, if your bones aren't strong, be sure and keep your muscles strong because if you don't fall, you won't break. Now we discussed the talk test, but have you ever heard of the stand test? In a study of people ages 51 to 75, the ability to stand on one leg for 10 seconds was associated with a 13% lower chance of dying in the next seven years. Go ahead and try it. Put your foot on your other leg like a flamingo and hold for the count of 10. Now don't be discouraged if you can't do it. You can start today with balance training so you don't fall and so you don't die. Last summer I did this test with my mom. She's in her 80s and I have a picture of her standing solidly on one leg with perfect balance. Now that didn't just happen. She has faithfully gone to the gym for many years. In fact, if I call her and ask her to do something, she has to check her schedule first to see if it's time to go to the gym. We have to work around her silver sneakers class. She says that her mom got her a membership many, many years ago when she was young and she's been going ever since. Talk about a gift that makes a difference. Wow. 
Your family of origin can set the tone for your activity level, but that doesn't mean you can't change it for yourself and the generations to come after. I know several people who have looked at their aging parents and seen their inability to be active, and that motivated them to start moving more and get in shape. Lastly, let's look at flexibility. That's the other kind of exercise. Now, this one probably doesn't do anything to prolong your life, but it sure affects quality of life. A couple of years ago, I fell on the stairs and jerked my shoulder out of joint, and I struggled to even get undressed. Instead of surgery, I used pulleys, physical therapy, and yoga to slowly rehab my shoulder and regain my range of motion. Shoulders are sneaky, and you can lose your mobility slowly and make it hard to reach and hard to do your activities of daily living. But again, there's good news. Just start where you are. It's never too late. We could keep going in the classroom and talk about things like NEAT, which is an acronym for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. This is the energy it takes for your body to function throughout the day when you're not exercising, sleeping, or eating. For example, the energy required to put in your earbuds and walk around the house picking things up while you listen to the podcast, or even just sit in a chair and take notes and swing your foot. When we talk about fitness, we need to understand something about metabolism. We measure the intensity of physical activity in METs. That's the metabolic equivalent of a task. At rest, your body consumes 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. That's your resting metabolic rate, and it equals one MET. Different amounts of energy are required to perform different tasks. Think of it as the energy cost of a task. For example, sleeping takes less energy, so it's equal to a MET of 0.9. On the other end of the spectrum, running requires 18 METs. But remember, we're talking about metabolism. METs are fixed, but our metabolism is not. So as you become more physically fit, your body works more efficiently. So it looks like we need another measure. We calculate activity in MET hours. Now don't make this too complicated. It's it's exactly how it sounds. A MET hour is the metabolic equivalent of activity for one hour. So when prescribing exercise, we use this number in a weekly equation. Take the number of hours per week you're doing a particular activity and multiply it by the METs per hour of that activity to get the MET hours per week. So, let's make it a little simpler. If you walk three hours a week, 3.3 times 3 is 9.9 MET hours per week. I don't know about you, but that's way more math than I'm interested in doing. I think it takes too much energy to do all that calculating. What we really want to get to is the bottom line. We all need an exercise prescription. Now, typically when a doctor writes a prescription for something like an antibiotic, they don't ask you which one you prefer. But if they did, I know you would pick a Z-Pack. Sorry, that was a little snarky. When it comes to an exercise prescription, your preference is super important. Otherwise, you're not going to follow it. In fact, we're usually not ever successful at doing anything in life when we try to do it because we're supposed to. Success is way more likely when we do things because we want to. My mom always says your want to's can change. So figuring out what you want to do is the first step. The format used for exercise prescriptions is really easy to remember. It's FIT, F-I-T-T. Frequency, intensity, time, and type, F-I-T-T. Frequency, how often are you gonna exercise? Measure it in days per week. Intensity, how hard are you working out during the session? Remember the talk test. Is it low, moderate, intense, and vigorous? Time, how long will each workout last? Number of minutes per session. Type, specifically, what are you doing? Aerobic exercise, strength or balance training, flexibility. Here's a simple example of a fit prescription. F, frequency, three times a week. I, intensity, can carry on a conversation but not sing. That would be what? You're right, moderate. T, time, 20 minutes. T, type, ride a stationary bike. Aim to meet those guidelines of 150 minutes of moderate to intense exercise per week. But remember, any little thing you do has benefits, and the benefits start immediately. I cannot say that enough. So where do you start? Well, just start somewhere and move toward your goals. And the overall goal should be to reduce your sedentary time, especially sitting at work or watching TV. Seriously, y'all, sitting will kill you. Your sit time is associated with an increased chance of dying from anything. Even if you exercise regularly, the more you sit, the higher your chance of dying. Now, we all have to sit, whether it's in the car or at home or at work. 
but to reduce your sedentary time, get up and move for at least five minutes every hour. You can use your watch or set an alarm, but class, it is time to stand up. Don't sit and listen to this podcast about how sitting is bad for you. Even standing is better if you stand for two hours a day rather than sitting. That decreases your chance of dying by 10%. Now that seems like an achievable goal. I know this sounds too simplistic, but if you want to walk from the couch to the kitchen, you need to stand up and start taking steps. It's no different with exercise progression. Over one to six weeks, increase your duration and intensity in increments. You don't want to have a lot of pain or get an injury. You want to work up to the next stage. So set yourself up for success with realistic goals and make yourself accountable. For me, it helps for me to go to a class so there are other people there. If you can, work out with a personal trainer. If you're not able to, maybe you can watch a video from home so you've got someone guiding your workout. Then you can move on to the improvement stage over the next four to eight months. Once you've met your duration and frequency goals, then start increasing the intensity. Remember, all of this is measurable, which is a very important component of SMART goals. Do you know about SMART goals? S, specific, M, measurable, A, achievable, R, realistic, and T is time bound. You can learn more about setting SMART goals in my seven day course if you sign up for the newsletter, but it is the most successful way to reach your goals. So get moving toward getting fit. Stand instead of sitting and stay tuned for more information about lifestyle medicine, but don't listen from your recliner. Start where you are and move more because fit and healthy looks great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or healthcare provider and take medications as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop and recommendations may change.